key text for today is Matthew 27, verses 14 through 26. And so I'm going to now begin with a, a reading of God's word for us. This is God's word to us today. May we have ears to hear. But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. This is God's word for us today. Amen. So as we come to this lead-in and this trial of Jesus, I wonder if you are like what I used to be like, where I did get lost in the details of Jesus' trial. Like I, I knew it in a general sense, but one minute he's in front of the Jewish council, and then he's seeing Pilate, and then he's with Herod, and then he's back to Pilate, and I, I used to get a bit confused and lost in why this was taking place. And this is one of the things that I really want to share with you this morning, help you get a, a grasp or an understanding of the trial of Jesus because of the significance of these events that are taking place. In, to do so, I would like to just take you back in Scripture, as you've got your Bibles in front of you there, to just come back over uh, to uh, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 26, as we go ahead and have a look at how did it get to be that Jesus is going from town to town and he's entered into Jerusalem and people are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're standing and welcoming as he comes in. How do we go from that to this trial where Jesus is standing before Pilate? Well, we understand that Judas has betrayed Jesus. Jesus said himself, he, he prophesied that one sitting at this table will betray me. And this, of course, turns out to be Judas, who trades in his beloved saviour, our beloved saviour, for silver, hands him over to the chief priests and to the elders. So if we're in chapter 26 then and see Jesus being brought into the Jewish council, just have a look with me at verse 57 of chapter 26. It says, Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the, crowd, uh, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Now, that is really, really important in understanding the trial of Jesus, that there was false testimony being brought in and presented about Jesus. We should probably stop here and ask the question, why do these people want to put Jesus to death? Why do the religious leaders of the day despise Jesus so much? I mean, if we think of what Jesus did as we look back into history, we know that he was a compassionate man who healed the sick, 
He raised the dead and he healed people of their sicknesses. Why would they want to put a man like that to death? The reason is because when Jesus came, he confronted their hypocrisy. The religious leaders were corrupt. They themselves were law breakers. They proclaimed the law of God, but they went and did the very opposite. They stood in situations like we know of the tax collector, where the Pharisee says that, and believes that he is holy and righteous before God, but looks at the tax collector and says, thank you God that I am not like this low life. And when Jesus comes, he calls them whitewashed tombs. He says that they're like a rotting corpse on the inside. They're painted on the outside, looking all fresh and clean, and here they are with their, with their robes and their special attire, yet on the inside, they're like a rotting, stinking corpse. He comes with a message and preaches with boldness of the kingdom of God. He claims, as we saw in our Trinity series, he claims equality with God. And if you had eyes to see and knew the scriptures, you would know that Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, but he's upset their order. He's upset their structure and their balance. And they want him dead. To, him, to them, he is a troublemaker and they want him removed. Do they have anything to pin on Jesus? No. So that is why when we read in the text, it says they're seeking false testimony against Jesus. So Jesus has been brought into what we know as the, the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. He has been brought in before the chief priests the scribes and the elders. This is the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. And under Rome, even though Rome is ultimately in charge, a level of authority still exists for the Jewish leaders. They still have power and authority in many circumstances regarding, to, regarding religious matters. Now, they bring in false witnesses with false testimonies to try and get something that they can pin on Jesus. But here's the problem. They can't get their stories to match. And under God's law, you have to have two or three witnesses to confirm that this is actually something that can be a charge against a person. And they can't even do it. They can't get their story straight. So it is at this point that there is this, there's this frustration. They're trying to, to get Jesus. And if we come back to the text here, in, uh, verse just down from where we're at, verse 61. Uh, sorry, verse, uh, verse, we'll go from verse 59. Again, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, uh, at last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God. That's a lie. <laughs> he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up. Uh, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and, and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? Was it, what is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. There's these accusations flying at Jesus. He remains silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, and that he has uttered blasphemy. So at last, the high priests, the, the Jewish council, feel like they've got something that they can get Jesus for. Blasphemy. Because he's, he's, uh, he's saying that he is truly the Son of God. Jesus is just agreeing with this statement that has been said, and they say, blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Now, why is it, it now that they're agreeing upon Jesus deserves death that they don't just stone him or execute him right here and, and then? And the reason is, is because under the Roman rule, they still had power for, for the death penalty. So they don't have the authority at this time to then just put Jesus to death. They have to bring this now 
they have to bring Jesus and this whole uh, facade, this whole trial before Pilate so that they can get what they want from the situation. Jump with me now to 27 where Jesus stands before the governor Pilate. Um, Chapter 27, verse 11. So we're seeing the flow here. He's been betrayed by Judas. He's been brought before the Jewish council. They've charged him with blasphemy. They want him dead, but they've got to go that extra step now. They've got to get him before Roman rule to to have him um, put to death. So here is Jesus, but now take note of the wording about what Pilate asks. It says here, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Shouldn't he have asked, Did you really blaspheme the name of God? But he says, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. Now do you think that Rome is really concerned with blasphemy? Imagine going to some of our leaders today and saying, hey, there's somebody in our society that's blasphemed the name of God. Are they going to act upon it? (laughs) They'd be doing it themselves, wouldn't they? And here is this situation where the Roman rulers, he's not interested in in blasphemy. That's That's not a charge that he's going to be interested in. So how did we get to this point where he's saying, are you the king of the Jews? Now, Matthew's gospel doesn't give us this bit, but here's the beauty of in your Bible having four gospel accounts. You get to see the story and understand what's going on from different writers' perspectives. Not that they have a different story, but some have more information than other writers. So do this with me now. Keep your finger here in Matthew 27, or your ribbon if you've got a fancy Bible, and jump over to Luke 23. Luke chapter 23. This is really important for just for understanding the significance of, of what is taking place here. Luke 23. Now, as you arrive at Luke 23 and you just glance back up, you'll see that there was a, a passage of scripture saying the same thing about Jesus being before the Jewish council. Uh, from 66, when the day came, the assembly of the elders gathered together both chief priests and scribes. So that's what we've just read from Matthew's account. We've just been through what's going on here. And now, as we look at chapter 23, this is the same point we're up to in Matthew, where Jesus is before Pilate. And let's read here. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Is that what the trial was about? Not at all. Why are they lying? Why are they now coming to Pilate with this accusation about misleading the nation and Christ being called a king? Because now it's political. Now it's political. And if they're going to get Jesus put to death, they need to bring an accusation that gets him pinned by Pilate worthy of death. And in this day, there is no king but Caesar. And you are to declare that Caesar is Lord. So they can't go in with the blasphemy charge. They've gone in with him being a rebel to Rome, him being a rebel to Caesar, and now pinning on him. So now, when we jump back to Matthew 27, we've got the context, right? When we see how, how when, when Pilate's saying, back to verse 11, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. We've now got our context. Why not blasphemy? Why is it the focus being upon the king of the Jews? Verse 12, but when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? So we're starting to get a sense of Pilate right now. Like, hey, haven't you got anything to say about yourself? There's so many charges that I'm hearing about you, but what are you going to say in your defense? And Jesus is saying nothing. Verse 14, he gave him no answer, 
not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Here is Jesus, gone from the betrayal before the Jewish council and now on trial before Pilate. Why doesn't Jesus defend himself? Have you ever been accused of something? Did you stand silent? (laughs) I didn't. I jumped straight into how am I going to get myself out of this one? How, how am I going to justify my actions here? And even if they were correct, my still, even if I'd been in the wrong, my, my, my place to go to was self-justify, preserve, self, look after yourself, protect yourself here. Natural way that we go as humans. But here is Jesus. And why is Jesus silent? Turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah 53. Let's do this. This is, this is wonderful. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Okay, this is the famous chapter where the prophet Isaiah is speaking of the Messiah, but not just speaking about the Messiah who comes, getting into the specific details of Jesus' death, even the details about his trial and the lead up to the cross. Uh, actually, let's go, let's go from verse 5, and why don't you read it out with me as we, as we go through here. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And our focus here about the silence of Jesus is verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Back to uh, Matthew 27. Jesus is saying nothing. He has just agreed with a couple of statements, but he is giving no defense of himself. He is silent before his accusers. What is he doing? There's a couple of things, major things here going on. He is fulfilling prophecy right there and then. In the trial, in this lead up to the cross, Jesus right there is fulfilling the very words that the Jewish people had been hearing and knowing and proclaiming to each other. And he's doing it right in front of them. He is silent before his accusers. And the other reason that he's silent before his accusers is because Jesus willingly chose to walk this path. He's not giving a defense. He's fulfilling prophecy, yes, but he willingly walks this path for you and I and for all who would call upon the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. He willingly takes this punishment upon himself so he gives no defense as he goes forward. Verse 15 of Matthew 27, our main focus for today. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And there, uh, sorry, they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. What is this custom being spoken of here? It is that at the Passover feast, there was this custom where Rome would release a prisoner that somebody would be chosen and released from prison. And the idea behind it was that this is some sort of uh, goodwill, kind of, I guess, a God-honouring act in in some ways that people are thinking that there's this kind of uh, giving over of somebody and and a giving freedom to, to somebody. But we should be clear that there is nothing God honouring about this custom that, that existed. Absolutely nothing. Because when somebody walks out of the prison, there is no justice served whatsoever. The person who is in prison is there because of a crime of of law-breaking, and then they're walking out with no justice served. This is not God honouring. This is God dishonouring. Now, in saying this, I'm not not informing or, or aiming to say that I agree with the prison system. Locking human beings up in cages and then using your taxpayers' money to feed them and and provide programs for them 
is a terrible solution to, to reforming our society. And if we know God's law, he actually gives way better things in his law about dealing with crime. God's law is beautiful. And we've got this, this system. So I'm not saying that, but somebody walking out with no justice is not the answer either. And so in, in, in many ways, this is a political act. You think of Pilate or you think of Rome and kind of giving over this prisoner. It's, it's a political move. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, when a politician, you think they're standing up for righteousness and maybe they even, they even claim to be a Christian. And so... <laughs> strike a nerve with that one. Um, claim to be a Christian. And so you, the Christians go, wonderful. We're going to have somebody who's going to stand up for God's law. And, 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 and then you see them in one sense, and they're, they're in some interview uh, kind of do, saying the right things for the Christian crowd, but then they're over here wishing well to the Muslim crowd. You might have seen that. And, and almost like we're just going to play these different crowd, crowds off. There's a sense in which that type of thing is happening here with Pilate. We won't dig too deep into that. Uh, story, that's for conversation for another day perhaps. But this is, bringing this to light is, is the sort of thing that we're seeing here. There's, Jesus' trial, there's, a, there's political agendas going on behind the scenes as we look at this. And so here is this man that is now about to be presented as an option instead of Jesus. Jesus could go free and we're getting a sense from Pilate that he, he kind of wants to hear from, he wants to hear from Jesus, Right? He hasn't really got anything that he, he thinks is convincing him, but there's this handing over and a potential of this guy named Barabbas. Does the Bible tell us much about Barabbas? Well, we have this little bit of information here in Matthew's Gospel. We know that he is a rebel against Rome. Uh, we know that he is a prisoner. But again, having multiple Gospels helps us to flesh out the full story. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read from two other Gospels some extra information about Barabbas. John 18, verse 40, says, They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So he's a thief. So if you just had Matthew's Gospel, you might think, oh, maybe he's just a guy that didn't agree with uh, things that Rome were doing and incited a bit of a stand-up against Rome. But when we have all the Gospels, we actually see this man is guilty of robbery and theft. Additionally, it gets worse, Luke 23 verse 19 says, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, so that's how we know about this rebellion, this rising up against um, the state, started in the city and for murder. So he's a prisoner, he's a rebel, he's a robber, and he's a murderer. Is this the very man that could potentially walk out instead of the Messiah? the innocent, blameless God of eternity, ultimately. That's who we're talking about here. Return to our, our key text, verse 17. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, we've just heard the account, right? Surely they're going to pick Barabbas, because murderer, robber. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. So there's some more insight now to Pilate. He knows that the, the Jewish leaders are actually envious of this man. He has, he has a following. He has performed amazing miracles and as a result, people are listening to his teaching. They're envious of him. And besides, verse 19, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Wow. Consider here this, this predicament of Pilate. We've got a crowd angry and wanting to put Jesus to death, but then clearly he's knowing what is right. Will Pilate act justly? Will Pilate be a man of conviction? Verse 20 says, Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. We think back to that moment that I mentioned about the triumphal entry. Those who were caught up in the moment calling out, Hosanna, Hosanna. People that would have just been uh, absolutely 
there worshipping Jesus as he came in. True believers and followers. Yet also people are just, like they do, get caught up in the mob. What are we doing today? Oh, we're, we're welcoming this king. So they're caught up and they start yelling it out as well. And they say that many of those same people who were there calling out, Hosanna, Hosanna, would have been there on this day yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Going along with the mob. And they say, destroy Jesus. Verse 21, the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. They chose to have a murderer released. Someone actually guilty. They chose to have him released rather than Jesus. And Pilate is still, he knows what is right here. Listen to the words as he, he, he keeps just trying a little bit more here. Verse 23, and he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. We see this type of mobs often, don't we? Where the loudest voice of the day wins. People do this in arguments. They haven't got a solid argument, but if they yell louder, they'll have to be right because they were the loudest. And this is the type of thing that is going on right now. Pilate's asking them, what, what has he actually done? What evil has he done? And they just get louder, crucify him, let him be crucified. It is clear that Pilate admits he has no charge against Jesus. So what will he do? Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Imagine saying that about the Lord. Verse 26, then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So this is the process, is that Jesus is sent out and before he goes to be crucified, he actually is whipped. This is, the, of course, the, the, the long uh, cords of leather that are, are bound together uh, and uh, metal and fragments of bone were used. Sharp objects were, were wound into this leather and he was whipped with this before heading to the cross. Was Pilate innocent because he washed his hands of the situation? Absolutely not. You can claim that you are innocent and wash your hands of any situation, but it doesn't mean that you are. It is God who is judge over us. We don't get to claim ourselves innocent. People do it every day. People declare their own righteousness before God. Refusing to surrender to God, they look upon their own righteousness and declare themselves innocent, as if they were the judge of the world. Only God is judge, Christ is judge, and we will stand before him. What can we say of Pilate's fear of God as opposed to his fear of man? Does he have enough fear of God that he would make a stand here? Or is it fear of man that has gripped him? Fear in perhaps losing his political position. Fear of this riot breaking out. The, 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 the peace is going to be disturbed here. This isn't going to be a comfortable and an easy day if this riot breaks out. What is of more value to Pilate? What we actually have here is a man pretending to not be able to tell good from, from evil. To not be able to tell right from wrong. The text has clearly shown us that he knows what is right, yet he's washing his hands of this situation. He is removing himself from Jesus altogether. Pilate is a coward. An absolute coward. Faced with an opportunity of right and wrong, he removes himself. He finds a way out for himself in this moment. And we should ask the question, will we be like Pilate in life? 
pretending to not know right from wrong? Will we be like Pilate and not have the Saviour in reach right there? To not have the Saviour being proclaimed to us and then still go away and wash our hands of the situation? Perhaps because we have a fear of giving up something in our lives giving up a comfort or giving up a position or having people speak ill of us rather just to appease the mob or to fit in with what the majority of the world is yelling about at the time. And the reality is that we could walk out of here today or walk out of any situation of hearing the gospel proclaimed and be a pilot. We could walk out and go, well, I heard about Jesus and I know that he's the saviour. I know that he is righteous. It was declared and I could see it and understand it. But you know what? I'm going to wash my hands of Jesus and think that that doesn't apply to me. And yes, in a sense, you walk out and it doesn't seem to affect you on the day. But there is a day coming where each one of us stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And on that day, it'll only matter what we did with Jesus. There is a similarity for us as well that we share with this, this thief, this murderer, Barabbas. If you think about the exchange of one guilty being set free and one innocent going in place, this is exactly what we have with Barabbas. Barabbas is walking out free of charges, not facing any punishment whatsoever. And Jesus is going to face the punishment in his place. This exchange has happened. Isn't this the very thing that has taken place for each of us? That when we call upon the name of Christ, when we repent of our sins and we we recognize Jesus as the Savior, the punishment that we deserve for our law-breaking and our sin against God doesn't come to us, but it has gone to Christ upon the cross. It is the same situation here. So many similarities of this exchange of Barabbas being Barabbas being like us. Yet there is a difference for Barabbas and then for us to consider. He walked out with temporary freedom. We have no record in history of what Barabbas did next. The Bible doesn't delve into a side story about what took place. Did he go away from this situation and look upon his murder and his sin and his rebellion and go, that was the true saviour. I need to repent and follow him. Did he do that? We don't know. Or did he walk out of there that day going, that worked out really well for me. Just going to get back to my old life of sin. We don't know this. But we do know about each other here today. We do know the reality of our own situation. That the gospel is proclaimed to us from God's word. We hear of the righteousness of Christ and this great exchange. And what will we do with this information? We could leave today and have a temporary freedom to just live our life the way we want and stay comfortable, yet still face the wrath of God. But if you repent of your sin and put your trust in the Saviour, that wrath, that judgment, Jesus has taken that upon himself in your place. In your place, condemned he stood. In your place, he became a curse. In your place, the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. We've we've sung about this already today. The wrath of God was satisfied in Jesus' death. Will you call upon him? Today we remember and we proclaim the death of Jesus for our sins. It is true what John the Baptist called out as he saw Jesus coming forward. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this very scene that we've looked upon today as we consider Jesus standing before Pilate and Pilate recognizing that he is righteous, is the very situation of the Lamb of God who takes away the world's sin. In Peter's letter, he points us to this saying that we have been ransomed, not with silver or gold, 
but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And that's what Pilate was seeing. The Lamb of God without blemish or spot. That's why he couldn't condemn him. This is what he identified. So will you come to the Saviour today if you have not yet? Will you come to the Saviour and turn from your sin and know the forgiveness, know the joy and have your life new, redeemed in Christ? This is the great news of Good Friday. This is why we call it good. That although we're guilty, although we've sinned, we can be forgiven. Although we've been a rebel against God, we can actually be one of his children, one of his family. Faced with the reality today of Jesus condemned in our place, may each of us respond with faith. May we be those repentant, knowing our sin, but then trusting that Christ died for our sin. By believing upon Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, let us turn to him giving ourselves entirely to him today. For he who gave his life for us is worthy of our complete devotion. Let us pray.